Let's open in prayer. Dear Holy Father, we do thank you for this night to be able to gather together as believers in a midweek service, Lord. To just have that extra assembling, that extra fellowship in these perilous times, Lord. Thank you for these dear people that have given of their time to you and to your church. In Jesus' name, we thank you. Amen. I want you to take a look at uh, 1 Corinthians 7, verse 39 which I'm using as a text. The wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth. But if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will, only in the Lord. So everything we're talking about right now, it's not dealing with what the heathen do. It's not dealing with what America does. It's dealing with what God has called us to be in a Bible culture, His culture. Now, understanding biblical marriage is not only important practically and spiritually in your Christian life, but it also illustrates for us aspects of our relationship to the Lord, His church, and His people. There are also prophetic teachings that we could understand better when you have a proper light on the subject of biblical marriage. You'll see that in Revelation chapters 19 through 22. It's also important for children. The Bible's holy. It's wholesome. And it uses its words very carefully. It uses its words in a plain manner, but also in a sacred fashion, at least the King James Bible. On one hand, we're always careful as much as possible to speak in the same way. It says in Proverbs 8, For my mouth shall speak truth, and wickedness is an abomination to my lips. God forbid you hear wickedness from the pulpit condoned. All the words of my mouth are in righteousness. There's nothing froward or perverse in them. Perverse jokes, speaking about true subjects in unclean ways. I mean, even some fundamental pastors have gone off into this in very unwholesome ways. And we've tried to never do that in this ministry. <coughs> They are all plain to him that understandeth, and right to them that findeth knowledge. So when you open the Bible, this is what you're going to find. This is what you're going to find. The Bible speaks plainly enough from the very beginning, while also speaking over the heads of very little children, you understand, in regards to the things that they don't need to understand yet. Marriage and marriage love. And procreation are not some unclean things to be defiled and trashed. And it's what's so sick about our culture and what has become this trash culture today. How it's taken purity and godliness and beautiful things and, and just trashed it all to hell. And people drive around in their car listening to that trash culture. The Bible says in Titus, unto the pure all things are pure. But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. I mean, they just trash everything, don't they? But even their mind and conscience is defiled. The Bible in Hebrews 13 says marriage is honorable in all. Nothing unclean about that. And the bed undefiled. Nothing unclean about that. But whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. So it's not to be perverted into uncleanness and wickedness. Remember the first recorded miracle of our Lord was at a wedding. As for those who say children should not even have a basic understanding about marriage, they should read only Genesis and Proverbs. 
Has anybody ever read Genesis and Proverbs? You know, go read the book of Proverbs. Let's we'll try to get through the first six chapters and, and tell me you're not talking about some things that, uh, that relate to life. Either children will grow up learning about these things in a godly, pure fashion while being discreet in public teaching, especially mixed company, or they will sadly learn it from the world in a defiled manner, in a way that trashes it. And God forbid we in our culture today have reached the bottom of the barrel. I do believe. I mean, this is the bottom. It's so much so now. There was a time when, you know, they spoke against the theater at the founding of our country. The government even issued a statement saying, uh, we are against this and it'll, it'll bring down the country, you know. Imagine what theaters were like at that time when you had preachers speaking against the theater. Look at where we're at today. Look how far we have come. So, our goal is to speak about some things in a basic way, in a basic way, a clean way, an honorable way. There are some basics you should understand, even as children. There's a song, a fun song that says, come on down to the farm, come on out to the barn. You won't see two roosters walking arm in arm. They couldn't make a chicken. They don't have an egg to hatch. When God said, love your brother, I don't think he meant like that. I don't think there's any child here that can't understand what that means. But today, they're telling you, marriage can be between two men, two women. Folks, understand Jesus is about to come. He said it would be as in the days of Noah. It'd be as in the days of Sodom. We are there. We are in the last days. And you understand these basics. This isn't right. It's not according to nature, and it's not according to the God of, that, that, that made nature and, given us, and has given us this biblical revelation. But there's a Kentucky. I want you to notice what happened when a band, a fella at, at some local gathering got up and sang this to the crowd. Uh, boy, that's a good thing. That's a good thing, uh, but, but it made the news. Anti-gay song causes controversy at concert in Midway. Was that an anti-gay song? I guess it was. I, I thought it was just a nature song, a creation song. Mayor Vandergrift, you can't help that, says he's received calls and texts from people who weren't happy about the song. He says he agreed. I personally was disgusted by what the song said. Are there some things upside down here, folks? You're, you're disgusted by what the song said? Why are you not disgusted at the unnatural, unclean, perverse insanity of what our culture has become? Talk about upside down. Mayor Vandergrift says some people cheered the song. Mayor Vandergrift says the venue wasn't the right place to sing the song because it was a family event. <laughs> Wait a minute. Family event. How dare you sing about biblical, godly marriage and creation and the way God intended nature to be and remind us of the barn and the farm and, and all of God's creation. How dare you? This is a family event. All you can have is transvestites and perversion and immorality. Folks, things are very confused today. A family event is exactly where that song needs to be sung. It's exactly where it needs to be sung. Even the band released the following statement. We deeply regret the events that transpired at the Midsummer Night's event in Midway. The audience member that sang the song is not associated with our band, and we apologize for allowing him to sing 
when we were not aware of the content. We returned the money we were paid to perform and asked that it be donated to an LGBT organization of the city's choosing. We apologized to the city of Midway, to those in attendance, and most importantly to the LGBT community as they bow their knee. God forbid, does that make you sick? This is where we're at today. Such effeminate, such passivity to just allow anything in the culture to go to the sewer. Wow. This is what's wrong with our nation. Now, I do need to say this. I'm not sure the barn song's true anymore. After GMOs and pesticides and antibiotics and hormones, I'm not sure what you'll see down at the barn. But people aren't animals. And even though there's an attack upon nature and biology, and certainly attack upon morals, God didn't want you to live like an animal. You know, there was a time in the 1930s when a researcher, some sociologist, uh, went around the colleges teaching the young people that you have evolved from monkeys. They're all looking at him, and he said, so we can make a study of monkeys, and whatever they do, you can do. Now, monkeys can do some pretty sick things. Dogs can do pretty sick things. You, you don't go watch nature and animals without a spiritual relationship with God. God never said, go watch whatever they do and mimic whatever perversity or disgusting behavior you see. Now, you understand that? You did not evolve from a monkey. Jude does say in the last days through the Holy Ghost, these speak evil of those things which they know not, but what they know naturally as brute beasts. In those things they what? They corrupt themselves. They're going to be like animals in the last days. That's what the church of Satan says to do. Live like an animal. J just deny this made in the image of God. Don't even try to get back to it. J j just whatever you do, live. If it feels good, do it. If you think it's good, do it. Just follow your lust like a brute beast. Brute means unreasonable, no sense, no, no higher reason to understand God. So with that introduction, the first thing I want you to understand about marriage is that it's first and foremost a covenant. It's a promise that you make. It's a promise that you make to each other, the person you're marrying. I believe it's a promise you make to the Lord. I believe it's a threefold cord that you gather there before your witnesses, before the preacher, and you stand there and you make a promise to each other and before God that you're going to vow to live only with each other in matrimony. And you know what the vows are. It says in Genesis 4, and Adam knew... Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. I'm telling you that marriage is first and foremost, not only, but first and foremost, a covenant. Adam and Eve were married before he came together with his wife and bore children that we know of. How are they married? Well, the Lord put them together, but all through history, biblically, we are shown that marriage is a covenant, a promise, vows to one another. Please don't lose sight of that. Don't lose sight of it. In Ezekiel 16, God makes this clear. He says, I've caused thee to multiply as the bud of the field. Thou hast increased and waxed and great, and thou art come to excellent ornaments. Thy breasts are fashioned, thy hair is grown, whereas thou was naked and bare. So she's mature now. She's of marrying age. Now when I passed by thee and looked upon thee, behold, thy time was the time of love, meaning time to get married. And I spread my skirt over thee and covered thy nakedness. Yea, I swear unto thee and entered into a covenant with thee 
saith the Lord God, and thou becamest mine. God makes it clear a marriage begins in a covenant. He says in Malachi, The Lord hath been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth, against whom thou hast dealt treacherously. Yet is she thy companion and the wife of thy what? Covenant. Covenant. Wife of thy covenant. You've made a covenant. Keep your covenant. Matthew 1 says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused, that means married, by the way, to Joseph before they came together. Say, well, how could they have been married before they came together? There's not a person that gets married that's not married before they came together. When the preacher says, now you can kiss your wife, and they leave, and everybody throws whatever they throw at them, they're married. Do you understand that? They're husband and wife. I now pronounce you man and wife. But while he thought on these things, Behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy what? Wife. Thy wife. For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Marriage is first and primarily, foundationally, a covenant. A covenant. When we concentrate there, then we can concentrate on keeping that covenant before God. You ought to keep your vows before God. You ought to read what the Bible says about not keeping your vows. In fact, a covenant, all covenants, all agreements should be kept even when it is difficult to do so. Many have gone and asked those in their 80s and such like, how did you stay married? And they looked shocked and answered the question this way. We keep our promises. There's not an option. You keep your promises. You keep your covenant. Well, didn't you have difficult times? They laugh and say, of course. You ever seen so-and-so, how difficult he is? Of course we, uh, we had difficult times. And they'll laugh and talk about how difficult it was down through the years. But guess what? When you keep your covenant, you stay together. The Lord makes this clear when he says in Psalms 15, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? That's talking about fellowship with God, and it is talking about the coming kingdom and those who will inherit it and live with the Lord during the millennium. This is very important business. We better listen. Who's going to be dwelling with God at the second coming? Uh, who's going to be rewarded as a good and faithful servant? It says, He that backbites not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor. Somebody says, Well, I didn't start the slander. I'm just repeating what I heard on Facebook. No. No. In whose eyes a vile person is contemned. But he honoreth them that fear the Lord. And he that sweareth to his own hurt. And changes the deal once the going gets rough. Is that what God said? No, 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 no. A million times no. Things get rough. Well, I didn't expect this to happen. No. He sweareth to his own hurt even, and changeth not. God looks down upon that and says, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. It was rough there for a while, but you kept your promise. God's saying, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. And I will reward you for that. Now, divorce is sometimes justified in the Bible but only when the cause is acceptable to the Lord. And in the sinful world, you're not always able to keep others from breaking their side of the covenant. See, a covenant has two parts, two sides to it. 
And you may say, I'm going to obey this. I'm going to keep my covenant no matter what. Whether you make me mad, no matter what happens, I'm going to keep my covenant. And I am bound to keep that covenant. And one thing I'll do with manliness, I'm going to keep this covenant. But you can't 100% control the other side. A covenant is a dual, a dual enterprise. And where there's free will, no matter how much you pray sometimes, no matter how much you try to help the other person, no matter what you do, you cannot 100% stop them from forsaking their covenant. And that's sad. But when they've broken the covenant, or put it this way, when they've walked in the cause or causes that God acknowledges that it's justified in those cases to divorce, God does not mandate that the innocent party stay in bondage to singlehood his or whole life, his or her whole life. But the divorce must be right in the sight of God. And the purpose of this introduction is not to enter into this subject of divorce and remarriage. It's just to, to, to let you realize that sometimes there is a just divorce before God. But we want to look at the general understanding and will of our Lord. And that is Malachi, For the Lord, the God of Israel, saith that he hateth putting away. Do you see that? That's Old Testament. Back when it was legal in the civil law of Moses to divorce. And it was not very specific. And sometimes for trifling reasons, they were divorcing their spouses, their wives. And God hated it. And God rebukes them and Malachi for some of the reasons that they were putting away their spouses. Sounds like America today. Well, I don't feel like I love them anymore. Well, they make me mad. Well, I've been talking to my boyfriend on Facebook. I mean, all these reasons that people have, I think it makes God sick. I think it disgusts God. How about that? I think God thinks it's abominable. I think God hates it. He hates it because what it does to the children, if they have children. He hates it because what it does to the testimony. He hates it because what it does to the picture between His church and the Lord. He hates it because it's a breaking of a vow, a promise. You saw what God did to Jonah. And out of the belly of hell, Jonah says, I'll keep my vows. I'll keep my vows, God. Don't worry, I'll keep them now. The Bible says in Matthew 19, Wherefore, they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together. Now listen to this. Let not man put asunder. That means there's going to be some people try to put it asunder. There's going to be some people on Facebook that are going to try to put your marriage asunder. There's going to be some family members that may try to put your marriage asunder asunder. You must beware that there are enemies of your soul and enemies of your marriage. And you must understand that Satan is going to send enemies to try to bust up your marriage. And you must be aware of this. And you must resist it. And you must be wise to get away from the serpent. You, you must be able to recognize, you know what? You're not helping me. In fact, you're starting to discourage me against my marriage. And you need to back up and get away from these people. And you need to guard the sanctity of your marriage. You need to guard the sacredness and holiness of your vows. We stand by these foundational words. We stand for the preservation of godly marriage. I have not changed my course in 25 years. I stand for the godliness, the holiness, the sanctity, and the preservation 
of marriage. And I will fight for your marriage. In fact, I will compare our record in the past 25 years to any other church. I sat down and tried to write down on a sheet of paper, and if you need to correct me, do so. Send me an email. I could count only about seven or so marriages in 25 years that have been lost. I'm talking about people in this church, church members, over 25 years of time. Now, you find a record like that in any other church, and I tell you what, I'll call up the preacher and say, what are you doing? Different than I'm doing, teach me. But so far, nobody's been able to find a better record. I'm sure they're out there, but you have a bunch of big mouth detractors. And I've challenged them over and over, find a better record in 25 years. That's from a church in DFW area, which is not exactly the most spiritual place. With lots of members coming and going. I say all that for you to have hope. For you to have hope. We are not a church, and I'm not a pastor that ever wants you to give up in a battle and be discouraged no matter what happens. There are some things you can't control. You can't control the free will of anyone. The story of the prodigal son shows that. Also, listen to what our Lord says in Isaiah 5. He says, And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard. What could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, it brought forth wild grapes. He says, what could I have done to my wife? What could I have done? And that's God. None of us are God. None of us are perfect. None of us, looking back over our lives, have been perfect and done everything absolutely that could have been done in a perfect way. But I'm telling you, God says even with all that He has done, He could not stop, in this sense, putting aside the mysteries of God, the free will of His spouse. And neither can you. And neither can you. But I don't want you to get discouraged. I don't believe in a discouraging surrender to Satan. There are things we can't change and often cannot avoid, but where we can, we obey God and we fight. And no matter what Satan throws at us, no matter what happens, no matter what happens, we just get up and we say, we're going to keep marching on. We're going to keep fighting. Let me ask you a question. Why the promise in the Bible of renewing your youth? Why over and over does it say, and God gives you good things to eat, that your youth may be renewed, and that if you seek God's wisdom, it'll give you the renewal of youth? Length of days, in other words, is how it says it. There is a law of entropy that is working against your youth. And one day it will have the last word until resurrection when you get the last word. Praise God for that. But it's so interesting that you're given promises to delay the waxing old of your life. It's an amazing thing. And I believe in fighting for that. I believe in claiming every promise of the Bible and fighting, and no matter what entropy or nature or whatever tries to do to you, no matter what old time tries to do to you, I believe you could fight against it in an amazing way. You say, well, one day it'll get you. Well, maybe not. Maybe Jesus will come before. I don't believe and say, well, you're going to get sick one day. You might get hit by a car. You might get in a plane crash. You might as well just go ahead and eat junk and just give in to Satan and be discouraged. And then you end up a church where it's like, wow, does anybody here not have diabetes? Does anybody not have cancer? I mean, are we all dying in that sense? I don't think that ought to be the situation. There are things we can't control. There are sins that you've done. There are misjudgments and bad foolish choices, and we pray for God to have mercy and heal. There are things outside our control and God's sovereign control, and we pray for God's mercy to heal. But those things we can fight, those things that we can change, we do not surrender to it. 
We do not surrender to a backslidden, ungodly culture. You understand that? That's not my way, and it's never been my way. You say, well, marriages are falling apart. Yeah, but we're not going to surrender. Well, people are falling into sin, falling into pornography. Well, we're not going to surrender. We're going to keep fighting the devil. Don't you tell me there's no use to fight the devil. You're a liar. Now, I'll tell you this. If you do things God's way in obedience, it might bring persecution right inside your family, right inside your marriage. And you may find out that things were going pretty good with Zipporah until you decided to obey God. You say, God, what's up with this? Do you know some may keep peace at the expense of purity? But the Bible says, no, no, the wisdom of God is first pure, then peaceable. In other words, it's first right with God. Obedience is what matters first, then peaceable. Oh, God wants you to be at peace. But what matters more than anything is your purity and godliness and holiness and obedience to God as the chief one that you love and obey and follow. I will remind you that Adam and Eve kept it together only to kill the human race in death. Ahab and Jezebel kept it together right till the end in great witchcraft and paganism, allowing Jezebel to rule and lead into whoredom. But where two people follow the Lord, spouses should try to do what they can to nurture each other. Husbands should place a hedge about their gardens. In Song of Solomon it says, and we should not give up that ideal. We shouldn't allow the free will of others to discourage us from hoping and fighting and praying. Listen to me, they say the average statistic, the average statistic of divorce among evangelical Protestants, non-Catholics, these are saved Protestants who believe in the blood of Jesus, supposedly, is at 28%. That's the average, 28%. You compare that to our statistics. It's usually agreed that it's somewhere between 15 and 50% even, depending upon the exact group of evangelical Protestants. That means there's some evangelical Protestants out there that are losing half of their congregations to divorce, so to speak. But I remind you, these are samplings of individuals. And the higher the marriage rate you have, the higher there is going to be a chance for divorce, obviously. So when they say, oh, well, you Christians have just as much divorces as unbelievers, that's right, because the unbelievers don't get married. They do what the Bible calls chambering and live together before marriage. So they can't have a divorce. Oh, they may kick, one each other, kick each other out of the house, but they don't call it a divorce. So they go up and they say, hey, have you ever been divorced? No. Well, I bet you haven't. You've just lived with people in and out of one boyfriend or girlfriend after the other. You've never been married. I guess you never had a divorce. But Christians that believe in marriage and godly marriage, of course they're going to have a higher divorce rate or at least an equal divorce rate sometimes, depending upon how you judge it. But I want to give you some hope. Focus on the family in 2011 reported, here's the truth. Many people who seriously practice a traditional religious faith, that's a pretty general statement, have a divorce rate markedly lower than the general population. The factor making the most difference is religious commitment and practice. The intuitive is true. Couples who regularly practice any combination of serious religious behaviors and attitudes, they attend church nearly every week. They read their Bibles and spiritual materials regularly. They pray privately and together. They generally take their faith seriously, living not as perfect disciples, but serious disciples. They enjoy significantly lower divorce rates than mere church members and the general public and unbelievers. So don't let anybody lie to you, okay? Well, they say, well, what about these Christians? Well, what, what kind of Christians are they? Are they church-going Christians? Are they God-fearing, fundamental Christians who believe God? Professor Bradley Wright, a sociologist at the University of Connecticut, explains from his analysis of people who identify as Christians but rarely attend church that 60% of those have been divorced. 
of those who attend church regularly, 38% have been divorced. We are nowhere near half in 25 years. And even some who ended up divorced said it was, it was never until they left church. The pillar and ground of the truth, when done right, it's not some absolute thing that will absolutely 100% preserve your marriage. But I tell you what, you commit yourself to God's church. You come faithful and stay and be plugged in. I'm not telling you the devil can't ever get a hold of you, but you'll have a better chance than anybody else. You'll have a better chance than anybody else. Bradford Wilcox, a leading sociologist at the University of Virginia and director of the National Marriage Project, finds from his own analysis that active conservative Protestants who regularly attend church are 35% less likely to divorce compared to those who have no affiliation. You go to get married, one of the things you better find out, are you saved by the blood of Jesus? Do you really believe in Jesus? Are you really saved? Do you trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior? Now, do you fear God? Do you believe in church attendance? Well, you better get that straight, and you better see and make sure that they believe in God's church, and they believe in attending church faithfully. Shanti Feldhahn says, in the good news about marriage, I summarize many of the indisputable research studies. And since 2014, many others have continued to find the same thing. For example, a brand new Harvard study and others find that regular church attendance lowers the risk of divorce by 47%, the risk of depression by 29 and even the risk of dying by 34%. That's part of the hedge that you are to put around your family. Church attendance to a godly church, a faithful church, not a perfect church. There's no such a thing because you're dealing with people. But a faithful, God-fearing church looking for the second coming of Jesus is part of that hedge. It's part of that hedge that you need to put around your family and your marriage. Now listen to me. When you look at what's happening today, it was prophesied, okay? It was prophesied. Nothing's a surprise that's going on out here with marriage and divorce and the way people are living. It says in 2 Timothy, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Dangerous times. Dangerous for your family. Why? Because men shall be lovers of their own self. They shall be without natural affection. That means the bonds between husband and wife aren't there anymore. And between children and parents, it's not there. It's been broken by this world. Truce breakers. False accusers, incontinent, can't control yourself. How are you supposed to survive a marriage with that type of thing? Traitors, they just betray one another. I don't care what I promised you, I'm going to betray you. Petty, high-minded, lovers of pleasure is more than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, boy, that's dangerous. Now you, have some, you think you're spiritual, though you're doing all this wickedness. For of this sort are they which creep into houses. That's where married people are. And they lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse love. They go after daughters. They go after wives. How did they get in the house? Social media? Social media? Hollywood? I heard of a case. Well, I found my old boyfriend. What, what, what are you talking about? Oh, I was on social media. I found him. We started talking, and so therefore... I'm going to commit adultery. What kind of insanity? What is this thing called social media? Unless a husband and wife are 100% in unity and together on this thing and watching one another, you better get far from that trash. You understand that? You be it'll destroy your marriage faster than anything because the devil can come through that thing. You understand it? He can come through it when you're not looking. But the Bible says, 2 Thessalonians, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except they come a falling away first. See, there's going to be perilous times when they're going to creep into houses, and a lot of women are going to leave their marriages. That's what the Bible said by a bunch of deceivers. And there's going to be this falling away. Falling away from what? From the foundations that God has spoken 
He even says in 1 Timothy, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, forbidding to marry. You shouldn't get married. No, 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 go do this, go do that, but don't get married. Then you end up in fornication, see. Unless you were called not to get married, you end up in fornication. It said in 2 Timothy 4, The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. It's sound doctrine to keep your covenant. It's sound doctrine not to cheat on your spouse. It's sound doctrine to keep your promises and your vows. What is this sound doctrine that they're going to not be able to endure? Oh, the Bible tells us, Titus 2, speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. What is it? That the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith and charity and patience. The aged women likewise, that they be in behaviors becometh holiness, not false accusers. God forbid that you've got aged women falsely accusing somebody's husband that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children. In other words, you ought to be known for keeping marriages together. It ought to be wherever you are, wherever you are at, people keep their covenant. After they talk to you, when they're around you, they keep their covenants together. It ought to not be that everywhere you go, everybody you talk to, you break up a marriage somehow or another. God forbid. to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. But the Bible says they're not going to endure sound doctrine. See, they're not going to teach this. They're going to say, to hell with all of that. I want nothing to do with any of this. This is an abomination. Oh, you're not going to endure sound doctrine. So we might end up saying, in days such as this, brethren, don't get married and don't have children. And the Bible does say that to some. It says in Proverbs 3, what's wrong with the world? What's wrong with this earth? For three things the earth is disquieted, and for four which it cannot bear, for an odious woman when she's married. The Bible said if you want all hell to break loose, if you want this earth to shake, if you want problems and troubles anywhere you go, let an odious woman get married. Because you can't have unity. You can't have unity. You're not going to have unity. But see, you can't just give up on marriage. <coughs> you can't just say, well, just forget it then. Because the problem is, not everybody's called to singlehood. Do you understand that? So Satan can come and tempt you because you're not called to... It's no excuse. It's no excuse if God hasn't brought you a mate yet or God hasn't opened up the door because there's no temptation that's taking you but such as is common to man and God will make a way of escape. But you're not to go against God's will and put off marriage and then you end up in sin. Do you see that? God never says that's an option. If you're not called to singlehood, then you're called to get married. You understand that? You don't play around with fire. You don't play around with fire. One of the purposes of marriage, and there's many purposes, to raise a godly seed, but that's not anywhere near the only purpose. There's all kinds of purposes for marriage. And one of the purposes of marriage is to preserve each other from temptation in these days, that you may both remain pure. See? And by pure, I mean holy before God. See, God says, but if they cannot contain, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. That's burn in lust and burn in hell. You understand that? You say, wait, wait a second. I forget marriage. I'm just not going to worry about marriage. Well, 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 you can't just sit here and burn in lust and burn in hell. You understand that? So marriage is something that, that you just cannot dismiss with if you're called to it. And not only that, everybody who tries to, and you end up with all these people that are not called to a life of singlehood, but they're out here single, and you know what they end up doing? They end up bringing forth children. And now you got children born out of wedlock. You say, well, I don't want children in the middle of divorce. What, well, do you want aborted children? 
Do you want children born out of wedlock? What's the alternative? I'm not going to teach a bunch of people to get married. Or are you going to teach them to be single and get out here and sin? Have a bunch of children that don't even know who their daddy is? The mama's not sure either? Speaking of which, the Supreme Court right now is discussing Roe versus Wade. And feminists argued today and warned the court that women need abortion rights for equality since children will hinder their career. So they need to be equal with men, they say. And therefore, if they're going to compete with men in jobs, they do not need some baby that they can't abort. Because they might get out of here outside of marriage and end up with a baby, and they want the right to kill that baby. And as the Supreme Court fellow said today, is 15 weeks not good enough for you? You have to have it later? You have to have it later? The whole thing is damnable and disgusting. But they want it all the way up to the moment of birth to be able to kill that baby so their careers will not be hindered. You talk about a satanic witch. You talk about a satanic witch. But let us have hope. Let us have hope to be watchful in these last days. Let me conclude very quickly with just a few verses about, let's get inside the marriage now, okay? And I just want to leave you with a reminder of what marriage is and what a godly marriage is. I'm going to tell you that a godly marriage is a closeness, a yoking together, a dwelling together. And never forget that. Never forget that. Okay? It says in Peter, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are. As long as you do well and are not afraid with any amazement. That is, afraid to be feminine. Afraid to obey God in these things. Likewise, ye husbands, listen, dwell with them according to knowledge. Dwell with them. Giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel and as being heirs together. Notice that. Of the grace of life that your prayers be not hindered. You ought to be praying together as husband and wife. You ought to be together as husband and wife. It doesn't mean you can't ever have a man's meeting and that you always have to have your wife next to you. But I tell you what, she ought to be there a lot. Amen. You ought to be together a whole, whole bunch. And you ought to dwell together. And you ought to do things together. And that's marriage. That's part of marriage. I want you to notice something here. Jeremiah 3. And I saw when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I had put her away, that's one thing, and given her a bill of divorce. Have you ever noticed that? The bill of divorcement is in some verses distinct. I'm not saying that you can't sum it all up as putting away in shorthand summary, but I'm telling you in a lot of, a lot of verses, putting away and giving her a bill of divorcement are two different things. Now, why? Do I tell you this? It means you can put somebody away and not divorce in one sense. So putting away is not exactly synonymous with divorce. Mark 10 says, and they said Moses suffered to write a bill of divorcement and to put her away. So in the Old Testament, it says, When a man hath taken a wife and married her, and it come to pass that she find no favor in his eyes, this isn't New Testament, this is Old Testament, because he hath found some uncleanness in her, then let him write her a bill of divorcement. That's one thing. Okay, I divorce you. And give it in her hand and send her out of his house. What if you get that reversed somehow or another? You are living with her outside of the house or, or, or like that in some fashion. You're not together. You're not in unity. You never see one another. And that's what this two careers in America does to the marriage. They never see one another. You might as well be divorced. You, you might as well be put away. And when she is departed out of his house, she may go and be another man's wife. Why would you live practically divorced or practically put away? If you have a wife, if you have a husband, 
dwell with each other. Dwell with each other. Be in unity with one another. Fight for your unity together. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Never carry your anger into the bedroom. Never allow that to break you up in your marriage. Jesus says, But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causes her to commit adultery. How do you cause her to commit adultery? Well, that's secondary causation. She's still to blame. But listen to, what, listen to what the Bible is saying. If you don't dwell with your husband or wife, you are bringing a temptation to adultery upon them. That speaks of marriage bed, but it speaks of other things as well that involve due benevolence. Because somebody's going to come and say, I will listen to everything. Now, you ought to resist that no matter what. You have no excuse. But we ought to think of it from this side. Don't tempt your spouse to go search for some type of yoking or unity outside of marriage. Whoever stumbles somebody else in sin is going to be in a lot of trouble. Woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must needs be that offenses come. But woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. Don't ever stumble anybody. That word offense means to stumble them, to provoke them to sin. Notice 1 Corinthians says, Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Are you having one another? I mean, as a wife, as a husband, are you yoked together? In all the ways God wants you yoked, let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence. It doesn't just stand for one thing. It means all the things that are due, including marriage bed. Likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer. Hey, do you mind if I go out into the woods and fast and pray for a little while? Well, how long are you going to be? You know. And she has a right or he has a right to say no. No, not right now. And come together again that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency, which means your lack of self-control, your flesh. I want you to see in this not only the unity the importance of due benevolence in regard to your wife physically, but there is a due benevolence in regard to husband and wife to avoid Satan just in regard to dwelling together. When you start drifting apart and you're not talking, you're not praying together, you're not close to one another, you're not in harmony anymore, oh, that's a bad. It's bad for the man because some sweet talking girl is going to come up and flatter him and say, I'll be sweet. I'll talk to you. And all oh, the girls, the females, they love that talking and they love to be listened to. And, it's, and some wolf out there is going to come say, tell me all about it. Talk, I'll talk to you. I'll talk to you. And if you go sin, you're responsible for it and shame on you. God forbid. But from the other side, let's not tempt one another. You understand that? Don't tempt your wife. Don't tempt your husband. Remember poor Leah? This is one of the sins of polygamy and how horrible and cursed it is. And in the New Testament, it is an abomination and it's adultery. But it says in Genesis 30, And Leah said, God hath endued me with a good dowry. Now will my husband dwell with me? She was married to him, but he wasn't dwelling with her. He was overlooking her a whole, whole lot. You understand that? You can be married but almost live as if you're separated. You can live practically unmarried. God forbid, Church of God. God forbid. I've counseled people for 25 years, and even before I became a pastor, I counseled them in regard to these things. And I'm telling you, there's a lot of separation going on in even godly marriages. 
so-called godly. And it ought not be. It ought not be. So I pray for your unity. We're going to, at this time, uh, stop the recording, and we're going to pray, and then we're going to open up a little bit of